Welcome to another episode of Chasing the Beast. I'm Chuck, and uh, glad you guys are with us tonight. Uh, got a great guest on the show tonight, a guy that's uh, become a really good friend of mine and uh, someone I respect and admire quite a bit for the amount of research that he's done over the years. I uh, want to welcome to the show uh, Tim Kumbo Baker. Tim, how are you, sir? I'm doing excellent. Doing really well. I had a good day today. <laughs> got a nice sunny afternoon and uh been out doing some work outside and so uh had a good day but i'm doing uh i'm doing very well looking forward to the weather warming up a little bit more so i can get out in the field some more i was going to say we've had quite a few cold fronts here in oklahoma and we're ready for some nice warmer spring weather for sure yeah i uh i took a little time uh Friday evening and went out poking around some, but it was still pretty, pretty dadgum cold, and it was pretty windy, so I had a hard time hearing anything because of the wind in the trees. But um, then, of course, yesterday we had <laughs> we had a bunch of more ice and such, but uh, it, it thawed out today and ended up being a beautiful day. And That's I wish the way. It, it turned ahead. out like that today too for us. I, I think it got up yeah. to sixty today, so it it was really nice weather. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I'm a I, here. Give it another. Oh, hopefully, maybe about three weeks, and it'll be good research weather. Yes, sir. I'm looking forward to it. I'm I'm kind of getting cabin fever. I'm ready to get back out in the woods. Yeah, I, I yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah, I was uh, I was up uh, Friday up in Friday evening in an area that I've researched, um, you know, quite a bit in the past. And uh, uh, but like I said, it was just too a little bit too windy and still too cold to really do any good. So, um, well, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I, had I, uh, do- I had a new dog with me. I was hoping to get to try him out a little bit to see if he had the, the, the possible makings of a booger dog. <laughs> well, you've had some good luck. You've had some good luck with the dogs, I tell you. Yes, I have. Uh-huh. Yes, I have. But uh, my my present uh, booger dog is is my little female German Shepherd, Zara. But she's, uh, she's coming up on 12 years old, so it's getting about time for her to retire. Right. Uh, although she still loves to go. She's a she's a good one. Well, Tim, there may be some listeners that that aren't really familiar with you, I, and I can't believe that that's possible. Uh-huh. But um, if you would kind of give maybe a short background of of how long you've been in this, and and uh, kind of give us a little bit of explanation of how you got your nickname Kumbo, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay. Well, I've I've been researching for. Uh, seriously for around 40 years. Uh, I got started back in the mid-1970s, and uh, I was already, you know, I grew up around around boogers there, or what I, we call, down south we call them boogers, and, uh, but they're, you know, Bigfoot slash Sasquatch. And I, I grew up around them. I had my first sighting when I was about four years old, and my first sighting as an adult was in uh, fall of 1980, October of 1980. But I had been researching for, uh, seriously researching, since back in the in the mid 70s. And my friend Jim Hart, otherwise known as Bubba Gump, had uh, he and I had gotten together and and started it, uh, started doing it uh, out on my farm, and. Uh, and I just sort of it sort of grew from there, and I went to work for the government in uh, in 1980, and then uh, I, I quickly learned as I started traveling around the country a lot with my with my job that uh, it wasn't very hard to find boogers <laughs> about anywhere. You know, I knew, I knew the sort of habitat to look for because of uh, being around them there in Northwest Alabama, and uh, I soon learned the right kind of people to talk to around a lot of the military bases and government installations that I was working on, and I started finding them in more and more and more places. And uh, I've actually researched 
seriously researched. I'm talking about feet on the ground, in the woods, uh, you know, out there all hours of the night and day in at least 38 states and the province, Canadian province of Ontario. And like I said, I started off uh, my first job out of college. I worked for a big public utility, and uh, my first job was laying out uh, power lines and such, and occasionally working on uh, cross-country power lines uh, coming out of a, a big nuclear plant there in North Alabama. And uh, then I, I went to work for a big test lab that did a tremendous amount of work for both NASA and the Army Missile Command and a lot of other uh, government agencies. I was there for about three and a half years, and I went to work for pretty much NASA exclusively for a number of years until uh, after the Challenger blew up. And I, I was in mission control when the Challenger accident occurred, uh, and I lost four good friends in that accident. Um, but after about nine months after that, um, I started doing a lot of work for the Army Missile Command and um, and other other what we call black projects or top secret projects. And I did that for uh, a number of years, and I left the government in late '93, early '94, um, and then worked out in private industry since then. However, they kept my security clearance active because I was called back periodically to to do uh, help them do modifications to uh, figure out modifications to be done to some of the uh, different things that we worked on. And uh, my security clearance finally lapsed, uh, I guess, about maybe seven years ago, mm. uh, six or seven years ago. They, they kept it active until then. But I held a, a top secret clearance during top secret and or a nuclear Q clearance for most of that time, wow. for at least 31 years. But anyway, um, I, uh, sorry about that, that was one, my dog throwing around one of his balls, <laughs> one of his toys. Um, as far as how I got the name Kumbo, I'm just a, I'm just a good old country boy, and uh, I grew up uh, out on a farm in northwest Alabama, and grew up hunting and fishing and such, and uh, back when we were just a bunch of poor kids, uh, <laughs> I was uh, one of my dad's friends. My dad wasn't interested in deer hunting, but I was dying to learn about it, and, and they had just started uh, opening up, a, had just opened up a deer season in Alabama, and one of my dad's friends got to uh, taking me. In fact, uh, I asked him, when we went to church with him, I asked him if he'd take me, and he said, shoot, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, anyway, we got to, got to deer hunting, and one time, I guess I was about maybe 16 or 17 or something like that, years old, and, and we were down at the deer camp, just a bunch of us kids, and it was uh, it was during the week between Christmas and New Year's, and, uh, of course, we were all broke, and we didn't have any money to buy food with or anything, and we looked around down there, and the only thing to eat, there was there was some chili fixings and some beans, but there wasn't any meat. So we said, all right, whoever, <clears throat> let's go out and eat anything that's edible that you see, kill it, and and, uh, and we'll, we'll make chili or stew or something out of it. So I came out, I didn't see anything that day, and came in and Anybody got anything? And, and one of the guys says, well, you know, Whitey killed an old turkey, old hen turkey in there, and he's got it in the pot, already got it parboiled, if anybody wants to make chili out of it or, or stew or something. And I walked in there, and, uh, and I looked in this big pot, and I said, that don't look like no hen turkey. Of course, I've never seen a hen turkey stuffed in a, <laughs> a big boiler before. And I said, I said, that don't look like the hen turkey or any kind of turkey I ever saw, but I pulled it out. It had pretty good-looking meat and everything on it, so it was already parboiled. So I stripped all the meat off the bones, and uh, again, I said, that don't look like any turkey I ever saw. <laughs> but, but 
<laughs> anyway, especially, you know, I got down the rib cage and everything. I said, turkeys ain't got ribs. <laughs> and I said, but I don't care. I said, I'm going to cook it. We're going to, I'm going to cook it and we're going to eat it anyway. So I, I cut all the meat off the bones and everything, diced it all up, threw it in the pan, browned it and, and, uh, and got out all the chili fixings and beans and such. I made me a big old pot of chili. Well, all the while I'm cooking, periodically all the rest of the guys are standing. They were all just a bunch of, you know, we were all just a bunch of young, you know, young bucks, and they were all outside laughing and cutting up, carrying on. I thought they were just out there telling dirty jokes and stupid stories and stuff. And there once while somebody would come into camp and, and fiddle around the back and then go walking out, and I'd hear a bunch more laughing. And I never put two and two together. And <laughs> anyway, I got the chili done, and you know, I said, I said, all right, I got, I said. I said, you know, got it ready to eat. Let's come on, let's eat. Let's grab it and growl. And I, and I'd found enough fixings to make a, you know, make a skillet of cornbread. And so uh, I had it all sitting there ready to eat. And so I cut me a big old piece of cornbread and got me a bowl of chili and sat down and started eating. And well, they were all still outside. And I said, I said, uh, and I stepped out and said, come on, it's it's getting cold. Let's eat. Well, I went back and sat down and nobody came in. Well, directly I heard a car pull up in the front and uh and heard some talking and everything and there's a bunch of laughing and stuff and lo and behold in the in the door walks joe bob stevenson our cook and he had a bunch of groceries and stuff and he uh he set a bunch of groceries down on the counter and he said he said tim you ever eaten any coon before and i said i said well yeah i've had some in a stew before over in the duck camp in arkansas and he said Oh, it ain't been that long. And I said, what? And he, 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 I said, what do you mean? He said, that's a damned old coon you're eating right now. And I said, well, that's good. And I said, it's real good. You want some? No, no, I think I'll pass. And so anyway, I ended up, he was over here, throw that shit in the garbage, you know. <laughs> throw it out there for the dog or something. I said, no, man, it's good. I ain't going to waste that chili. So I ended up over the week, next few days, I ate that whole big pot of chili by myself, coon chili. And so they started calling me Coon. That was my nickname for several years. Well, then up years later, I'm working for the government, and uh, I'm out at, spending some time out at White Sands Missile Range and fell in with a bunch of guys that like to shoot these military rifle matches. So I got to shooting some of that. So I bought an FNFAL match rifle, which is a big old, it shoots a 308 or 762 by 51, and it's a you know big Rambo-looking rifle. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we were shooting 600-yard matches with it, and, and uh, you know, I really liked it. And I was shooting against a bunch of guys that were shooting M1As or M14s or right. M1 Garands. It's, that, it's the same caliber rifle. And, uh, anyway, um, I decided I was going to take it deer hunting. I got good enough with it. So I brought it down to deer camp, and, of course, I came walking in with that thing. That's before you ever saw hardly anybody hunt doing any kind of serious hunting with what's now called a, quote, assault rifle, unquote. Right, right. <laughs> Although this is just, you know, semi-automatic only. Right. And I had, uh, of course, I had a 20-round mag, but I had to block it off so it only holds 10. And um, anyway, so I went out and I killed several deer with it. And, so, and they got teasing me about that damn Rambo rifle. And, uh, and I came walking in with it one day, and I'd killed a couple of deer with it. And they said, oh, hell, there's old... Rambo Coon, and then somebody shortened it to Coonbo. That's how I got the nickname. <laughs> that's that's a great story. That yeah. is so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but my wife knows that when the phone rings and it's somebody asks to speak to Coonbo, it's either one of my somebody one of my hunting buddies from back home or one of my bigfooting buddies. So right. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tim, I want to switch gears with you tonight. Yeah. Um, some of the people I know have heard your stories, and I, I want to maybe talk about a different subject if we can. Sure. Um, there's so much drama right now in the Bigfoot world uh, about hoaxers. And I'm not going to mention any names because I don't think the names need to be mentioned because it's, right. it's pretty much front and, front and center on Facebook. I mean, it's crazy what's going on. But mm -hmm. in all in all your research over all these years, um, did you ever run across people who would call you out to investigate something um, that ended up being a hoax? And and how did you figure out 
it was a hoax that was going on, or what what are the things to look for uh, if if somebody calls you in for some type of investigation like that? Well, actually, that has happened several times, Chuck, and and you know I've I've sort of figured it's happened enough that I've sort of gotten a, a little bit of a profile of of people that do that, and some people do it just because they want the attention, and um. You know, they're just. I've had I've had some people do it that uh, have you know come up with hoaxes and things and you know stories that were obviously false or made up, and it's and it's they're wanting you know they're wanting to uh, uh, you know they want to be part of the group you know part of they want they they want the attention to be sort of included in the community or something, right. and then. Um, then there are people who who have had legitimate sightings, and you know uh, the evidence is there that there's they're definitely some there was definitely something going on on their property or where they were, and there's no doubt that they had a sighting, but then for some reason they want to just over embellish the story. Hmm. You know it'll start off as something plausible, but as it goes on over time, or and maybe even maybe the first incident or two that they, that you know, I hear from them are legit incident incidents, but then they keep coming up with these additional incidents that supposedly happen, and it becomes obvious that that they're not telling the truth that they're fabricating things right. and and you just sort of have to know for one. One of the things that's helped me smoke out some of these is just my knowledge of of animals and stuff, and then my experience with Bigfoot, and you know knowing some of the things they do and they don't do, and and uh, I'll sort of come back to that here in a little bit, but then you have some, then you have these guys out there that that they purposely hoax to try to. And they're some of the big name people that that you hear about. That some of the mm-hmm. crap that you've been hearing about on the internet lately. Right. That they're actually trying to dupe people for monetary gain. Right. Or they're trying to greatly enhance their their stature in the Bigfoot community. Mm-hmm. But then there are also people that hoax specifically. They specifically try to hoax or hoax trying to embarrass. Researchers, or try to trick a known, a well-known uh, researcher into buying into their uh, fooling them enough to buy into their story, and in here they can they can trick somebody that's that's known in the community, and then there then there are people that just right out of the gate you, you listen to their story. And they're just too much crap. It, it sounds like a collection of, of, of my sighting reports or something, or, mm. or just a collection of sighting reports that, that have been, uh, that are you know pretty well known, uh, you know from, from in the community, or things that you know characteristics that we've, that we all have have any any of us that have been in the field for very long or been doing this for very long that, that we. All know about, and it, and they've just taken a a whole sampling of that type of stuff and put it all together into a story. And what they don't realize is that uh, you know often less is more. You know, you you start trying to put together too much super convincing stuff, and it's just it becomes implausible. Right. And there's just that it just that kind of that amount of stuff doesn't happen, but. I'll give you a for I'll give you a, a for instance of somebody being sucked in. Okay. Um, there was an incident that happened a number of years ago down in Paris, Texas, and there was a group that was. Now let me I'm gonna back up. Um, they were a part. They had become a part, sort of infiltrated, a well-known. Um, Bigfoot Research Group down in Texas. 
And I know the guys that started that group and are still involved with with what's left of that group, and they're straight-up guys. They're really good right. guys. But right. they had a bad element that had gotten into the, into the group, and they were working down around Paris, Texas. Well, this was this was all. Um, they were re- doing a lot of research on and around some property owned by a fellow by the name of Mike Sells. Now he has since passed away, died of cancer. Um, as they were, and I, I've been on Mike Sells' property a couple of times. And I'll have to tell you, and if you go down there, he didn't have a big tract of land. He only had like maybe three acres or so Mm -hmm. at the most. Three, no more than five acres. And I'm guessing probably closer to three. And a, a public road went around two sides of it. Excuse me. There were public roads around, totally around two sides and half of a third side. So you could drive, you could drive on pub, uh, public roads and see every square inch of his property. Mm. And the property was surrounded by open fields on two sides, and half of another side was open field. And the front part of his property was in a residential neighborhood. Now, if you look at it on a topo map or a or satellite view, his property did lay in between two large tracts of wooded land. And I don't doubt that at times that there were boogers that, that traveled through that area trying to get from one of those tracks to another that would cut through his property as sort of a shortcut. But they had to cross at least a quarter to a half a mile of open ground to even get to the edge of his place. And it didn't really afford that big of a of a of a shortcut. They could there was a longer route that they could take where they could remain hidden most of the most of the way. And I imagine it was probably only during times where it was foggy and limited real limited visibility that they would risk crossing all of that open ground. To, to cut across his property. Now, the guy, so I believe the guy probably had some legitimate sightings on mm-hmm. his place, and got to talking to some to some of these uh, some people in this research group. Well, unfortunately, the people that in that group that were close by was this group of hoaxers mm-hmm. that had infiltrated this group, and they got to and they got to working with Mike. And filling his head full of a bunch of crap. And they started looking for other gullible researchers that they could suck in. Mm. Well, they found a guy in our group. And uh, the the Bigfoot community was a lot smaller back then than it is now. Right. And so they sucked in. He took the bait, hook, line, and sinker so bad that the hook, line, and sinker, and bobber, and probably 30 feet of line were hanging out of his ass. Mm. He, he took it. I mean, he he ate it up. They played him like a violin. And he was not uh, cautious enough. Well, they started trying to, They one of the deals that, I think one of the reasons that they had, uh, that they went after this guy, because he had publicly talked about, his ideas on how to trick a booger or trick a Bigfoot so that you could catch him on camera. Things like pointing the camera towards a mirror and stuff so that the camera's pointed in one direction, but a Bigfoot doesn't understand what a mirror is. So he'll walk up behind the camera, and the camera's pointed at a mirror, and he, does, and he doesn't realize that, that, uh, that the camera re- re- is recording the booger's reflection showing up in the mirror. That was one of his tricks that he used to talk about. And anyway, so they started stroking him with that, and they and they started doing things that this guy, well, 
this was this happened this was happening in the days before the outlaws had even been invented. A lot of people don't realize it. The outlaws was a were a they were a name that was given to us by one of our members by by Matt Knapp, and that didn't come around until probably just about maybe five or six years ago, something like that. For a long time, when we first got, all got together, we were members of the GCBRO, and then there was a blow up. Um, then there was a blow up in the group, and we sort of regrouped with a in a in a in a organization called the Monkey Chasers. And then there was another blow up in the group, and then we sort of semi got back together with um, uh, with the Kaimichi Giants, and and we're just starting to get together with with Mike Humphrey when all of this crap started going down down there in Texas, and then that blew up in uh, in this person's face. And this same person had, was the one that had precipitated a lot of the blow-ups mm. um, in the past. Okay, so we are. Uh, this person starts talking to the rest of us about, oh man, I'm working with these guys down in Texas, and they're filming all this stuff, and they're doing what I'm telling them to do, and they're they're getting all this all this wonderful video, and yeah, 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 and and I'm thinking. Okay, well that's that's pretty cool, and uh, but then we get to checking it out and uh, the property and everything, and I'm thinking, well, that just doesn't seem right, and because I'd gotten the location of the property, and I looked at it under on Google Earth, and even though that was back at the time was a very early version of Google Earth, I could still t- didn't have near the resolution it has now, but you could still tell that why. There ain't no freaking way that there's that much activity on that little tiny piece of property. And then we started getting little little samples, little enticements of little snippets of the video that he would share with us. And we all looked at that and you know, my first impression was, you know, that's BS. You know, that's a bunch of crap. Right. And, you know, that and then there was a couple of them I said, Well, hell that's just somebody running through the woods in a and I said, a black coveralls or dark gray coveralls. I said, and then there was one of them. I said, my God, it's nothing but that's just somebody wearing a big pair of clunky boots and blue jeans and a, and a, and a denim jacket <laughs> and with a toboggan pulled down over their head. Hmm. And it, it was it was just ridiculous. And um, And we kept telling this guy, I said, Dude, that's not that's not you know, that's just a bunch of bunch of crap. Somebody's feeding you a bunch of crap. Oh no, it's the real thing, it's the real thing. Well, I don't know. So anyway, he begged us and begged us. He finally had this big huge reveal that was gonna come up one weekend. So he begged us and begged us and begged us to go down there, to come down to Paris. So I left here and I drove down to Tulsa and picked up Matt. And we drove down to uh, Muskogee, and I believe it was, and picked up uh, Chad Scott. And we met another well-known researcher down there in Paris. Got a motel and everything, and so we went out to this uh, to this place. And they were supposed to have this big gathering out at this uh, some fairly well-to-do people that had become associated with the, with this particular research group. And they were willing to throw this shindig and a big, big barbecue dinner and a bunch of crap like that to sort of kick off this, you know, big, huge reveal of of all this wonderful Bigfoot uh, film, you know, video and everything. Well, we get down there, and the first thing that happened that raised the red flag was they were introducing us around, and some people have just a sense of the character of a person and some people don't. Right. And there was a guy in their group by the name of Lance. And as soon as I was introduced to him, 
everything, every red flag, every suspicion that I had went in full tilt into the red zone. And I just, as soon as I shook hands with that guy, I knew that he was up, that he was probably probably the, the number one hoaxer, probably he was a hoaxer, and that he was definitely up to no good. And he had a little group of guys, like two or three guys, that sort of hung around on the fringes of this bigger, this this uh, this group. And we were supposed to go out to this to this site where they'd been calling them up, and everything. And I just I was just sort of keeping my eye on on it, on on this character. And about 20 minutes before we were supposed to leave, he. He's over there, and he says, you know, he's talking with these two other guys, and they left. They slipped away. They went out the went out the door. Well, when they did, they didn't say, "Hey guys, we're going to store. We'll see you later, or we'll meet you down there." Nothing. They just walked out the door and didn't say a word to anybody. Tried to sneak out. Tried to sneak out. And I thought, uh huh. <laughs> I mean, as soon as I saw it. Like I said, the red flags went up even more. Right. And so, about twenty, thirty minutes later, we left and we went down to this, down to this creek, and we were sort of the, that went under a bridge right off the side of a big highway. We went down there, and this guy says, "Yeah, we come down here, and, and we uh, and we knock, and and you know, and they'll usually answer us. Well, and we like to knock on this, we knock on this power pole." So uh, I'm thinking, uh huh. <laughs> so, so we get down there, and this guy walks up to this, to this, um, to this power pole that's right there beside the, beside the creek and the bridge. And I can't remember. He might have had a baseball bat, but he certainly had a big stick of heavy hardwood, you know. Right. And he walks up there to that to that thing, and he goes. Wop, 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 wop. You know, just about that fast. You know, five, five hard, quick whacks on that on that power pole. And I'm thinking, holy shit, this guy doesn't have any idea about how to do how to do a knock. I mean, not only is a hoaxer, he doesn't even he doesn't know his ass from a hole ground. He doesn't know even how to how to do it. Right. And then and then immediately. Out to down the creek to the and I, I don't it might have been to the north of us I think it was to the north of us we hear a woo you know an answer back <laughs> and I said and I looked at Matt and Matt looked at me and we shook our heads and <laughs> and uh, and I can't, one of the some other one of the other guys I don't remember if it was Chad or the other researcher that went that we met down there. Said something like, "This is bullshit." And I said, "Well, yeah." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I just I couldn't keep my mouth shut, and which I know that really surprises people. But uh, <laughs> I, and I told him, I said, uh, "You don't know what you're doing." I said, "That ain't no way. That ain't the way you you do knocks." I said, "I don't know." I said, "Well, that's what they do them down here." I said, "That's bullshit." I've researched around. East Texas enough to know that, that they don't that they don't do that here. I said they don't do that anywhere. I've researched all over this country and I've never heard it. I said this is a bunch of crap. I said I'm getting my ass out here. And then then somebody else, one of the other guys that said, uh, "Well, let, let's go up there. To, we got we want to go up to this place up on Pat Mays Lake. Y'all need to you know, y'all need to see that." Well, I had heard about the boogers around Pat Mays Lake, and again, this is one of the tactics. Pat Mays Lake is a is a is a good research area, and I mean I had I had heard about it multiple times in the past, and so I said, well, all right, I know there's buggers up there. All right, we'll go down there. We'll go to Pat Mays Lake. So we loaded up. And we head to Pat Mays Lake. Well, we get up there to Pat Mays Lake, and uh, and this Lance guy, he takes off down the. Uh, we get out, and normally I get normally when we go to a place. Uh, any place, even places where I've known them or I've been there before, or not. 
we get out, and, and I like to be quiet and just sort of stand around for minimum 10 minutes, usually 20, 30 minutes, just sort of getting a feel for the place and just listening. Let our right. ears get adjusted to the sounds of the, the, the night sounds there. So we get there. So this Lance guy takes off hauling ass down the boat ramp, down towards the water, away from the rest of the group. And he comes in, hey, guys, come here, look at this. I found some tracks. I found some tracks. I'm like, oh, dear God, you know, you don't yell like that, <laughs> like that out there. So, right. here, so we go down there. Well, there's a good set of big old tracks right off the side of the boat ramp going out through some through some weeds and stuff and, and headed down the bank of the lake. And I got to looking at them. The tracks are obviously made with a set of stompers. I'm talking about wooden cutouts. Right. It did not have the correct... When, when, a, when a Bigfoot walks on soft ground, you need to, and you can get online. Everybody's heard about the mid-tarsal break. Right. What that does is when it, when it walks across soft ground... When the heel hits the ground, it shears the ground, and it shoves the dirt up in front of the heel in the direction that the thing's walking. Right. Then you got the mid-tarsal break that allows a hump to be in the middle of the track, and then the ball of the foot and the toes dig in as it pushes off with a step. When you find when something's walking at a pretty good clip across soft ground, now, you do find flat tracks that don't really show the mid tarsal break. You do find some of those. Right. But when you've got a trackway out there on soft ground where you are leaving a good deep track, then they almost always, some of the tracks will show this hump in the middle where you can tell where the heel has, when the heel strikes the ground, it digs in, and then when it, and then it, as its foot rotates, as it as it continues to bend, that mid tarsal break bends. The weight then bears down on the ball of the foot, and it digs into the ground. So you've got the so the deepest parts of the track are the heel and the ball of the foot, mm -hmm. just just behind the toes. And these tracks were every one of them just as flat as a flitter, you know, just. Flat as a pancake. Easy to spot. Easy to spot. And it was it was obvious that somebody had made them a set of set of stompers out of you know carved them out of plywood or a or a two by eight or two by ten or something like that. Had them strapped on the feet and they were jumping from they were jumping from you know track to track to track you know making these tracks and were trying to achieve about a five foot stride. Hmm. And that's another thing. I was able to, right there beside them, hop and make the same depth of tracks with with my feet, with my big number 13s, mm -hmm. which and I wear, and I usually wear pretty good, I wear sturdy boots in the woods, and I was able to pretty damn closely duplicate the same uh, imprint into the ground that these tracks are. When you find, when you find good booger tracks, I haven't seen anybody yet, unless they were in snow, that to du that could duplicate the depth of the impression. Mm -hmm. If they, you know, jumping right on right on the ground, right beside them. So, so I just said, I we just, you know, Matt and I looked at it. And we just said, this bunch of shit. They had promised us this big barbecue dinner uh, when we got back. Right. And Let's so we. So, Let me ask you something real quick. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, you can also tell. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh -huh. Like if a if a guy's got like wooden wood on the you know on his boots connected to his boots and he's out there making uh -huh. tracks. Uh huh. Uh, a human set of footprints are almost side by side as right. he's going as he's going. Right. Now the tracks that I found. That are burger tracks. They're in a line. They're, all, they're almost in a straight line. Exactly. You'll have a right foot and a left foot, and yep. they're directly in front of each other. That's correct. Okay. Well, this guy was good. This guy was good enough that he had 
pretty closely gotten that. He had pretty closely gotten gotten that. But um, everything else was, uh, you know, there were some, there were all these other things that, that pointed that you know that it that they were faked tracks. Right. And we looked at it, and uh, Matt and I looked at them and said. Uh, <laughs> I've seen enough. We need to get our asses out of here. But by God, we've driven down here all these hours. You know, I'd, I'd come all the way from northern Missouri, and there were, you know, Matt, you know, I'd pick Matt up, and he'd been all the way from, uh, you know, from Tulsa and Chad from Muskogee. And, well, by God, we're at least going to get a free barbecue dinner out of it. Come on, let's take our asses back to the – well, you guys can stay out here all you want, but – you know, he was there. He was right there with them, and he said, "Y'all can stay out here all you want. We're gonna go back and get our damn barbecue dinner, and we're probably gonna go to the house. We've, you know, we've seen enough." So that's what we did. We took off. We went back to the to the joint. We showed up, and and uh, look, hey, you know, we've been on the road a while. We're gonna get our eat dinner, and then and then then you know, go to the motel or something like that. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So they, you <laughs> know, so we got our barbecue, and we sat down. And they said, "Well, we're going to, we'll put the we'll put some of these videos on so you can watch them while while we're while you're eating." Okay, so they put the videos on. Now, these are well-to-do people. They had a very high for the day, a very large, very high-quality big-screen TV mm-hmm. that they were putting them putting these videos up on. First time, maybe the first time that they've ever been viewed. On a on a large screen TV, on that big screen TV of that quality, it was obvious that these were that these were hoaxed videos. Very obvious. It was. I mean, you could tell that. You know, some of them were some of them were just a a, a damn guy in a in a pair of maybe black jeans and a damn hoodie, or. Mm-hmm. And some, like I said, some of them were. It was at a distance. You tell it was just somebody running across there in damn blue jeans and a, with a denim coat on and a toboggan yank down over their head. <laughs> and there was there was one, there was one where uh, it was obvious that the guy just had on a pair of cover, you know, just a set of coveralls, like Carhartt coveralls, or something. I mean, it was on that big screen TV. It was very obvious that it was just somebody in there in these videos. And of course, you've seen, probably a lot of people have seen the one where the where the booger, supposed booger, comes running out from behind this guy's barn and runs down beside a fence row and then steps over the fence. Right. All right. That ain't the way boogers cross a fence. That's the way I cross a fence. And my dad and anybody anybody that's that's been raised out in the boonies, that's the way a human crosses a fence. Right. You run up there and grab the pole, throw your damn, you know, lean forward with your belly towards the 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 top strand of the barbed wire and throw your legs over one at a time. Right. Kick them out behind you and throw your legs over. That's the fast way to get across the fence, unless you unless you run up there with a, enough speed and vault it. Right. And uh, plus, I have heard too many, I have heard too many reports of boogers just stepping over a fence. Right, exactly. And I have found tracks where the booger just stepped over a fence, and you know they don't they don't cross them like we do. And uh, there's another very prominent researcher now that's gotten a hold a hold of some of those videos and is trying to prove them that they're that they're correct. And he's been been out there to sell his old property, but he ain't been to the right. He's been doing it by himself. He's gone to the wrong places. His his perspective is off, and I've been t- I've told him and told him that you're playing with dynamite. That those are right. hoaxed hoaxed videos. I mean, well, they're poison. You need to leave I've, them alone. I've seen the one that that you just spoke of of stepping mm-hmm. over the fence, and I've also right. there was another video I saw from down there where uh, the story was that. They had a trail cam out there, and one would climb up in a tree and shake yeah, the tree. Yeah. Well, yeah, you that's can, BS. <laughs> yeah, you can clearly see that that it's a 
person wearing a hoodie. Exactly. Exactly. That's a, that's a quick and easy way to produce a if you if you backlight the person, that's a quick pretty cheap and dirty way of creating a sagittal crest. Right. Put a put a damn hoodie on. Right. <laughs> I mean it's it's ridiculous, and it supposedly runs up this tree and shakes the tree. Right. <laughs> and but anyway. I'm, I'm just describing the hoax. I, mean, I need to go back. We need to go back on towards uh, the, the 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 why part of it. Okay. So these guys, obviously, what they were trying to do, they were trying to discredit. I believe their ul- ulterior motive was a. I think they, I think they got involved with Mike. Mike was a. I think Mike was uh, was probably I never really knew him. I only met him once once or twice. I think he was a sincere guy that had had some legit sightings on his on his place. But they were taking advantage of him. Right. These guy these hoaxers were. But I think that they were doing it in a in a nefarious method of they were that they were going to try to suck in as many quote legitimate unquote, researchers as they could to try to make them look bad. Mm. And they definitely caught one. <laughs> right, right. And and uh, which I'll, I'll go on about that. Like I said, this, uh, they sucked him in hook, line, and sinker. And they they stroked his ego and his personality as they did it. They, you know, claimed that they were using his methods that, that he taught them. And, oh, man, those work really good. No, they, like I said, they were playing him like a fiddle. And right. we tried and tried and tried to tell this person, and he wouldn't listen. But anyway, we watched the videos. We sat, As we were eating, we sat there and watched these videos. And I just got sicker and sicker, and I said, I, I, so I started just wolfing my food down. And just quick as I could wolf my food down, I got up got, and walked out, walked out the damn door. And I'm standing out there by my truck, and I'm thinking, um, <clears throat> I'm thinking, I ain't gonna hang around here any longer. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go in there and get Matt and Chad. We're gonna load up this truck and get our ass out of here. Mm-hmm. And, and about that time, before I could even get back to the door, here comes Matt and Chad out. <laughs> they said. What'd you think? And I said, it's all bullshit. We totally agree. I said, I'm getting my ass out of here. We're with you. Let's go. And about that time, this other researcher that we had met, he comes out the door. And I mean, he is throwing stuff mad. And he, I drove all the way down here for this bunch of crap. You know, I mean, he was he was furious. He said, I'm taking my ass back to Oklahoma. And I said, I said you're going to have to move your ass quick. Stay, in front, stay ahead of us. <laughs> we both piled in our trucks, and 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 I backed my truck up out and turned around so fast I backed into a damn big streetlight pole out in front of their house, put a big crease in my bumper. But hell, I didn't even stop to get out to look at it. I just threw it in gear and got got our asses out of there. And like I said, we all went back, and I can't remember if we spent the night at the motel or if we just hauled ass and drove straight back to Oklahoma that night. I can't remember. Went back uh, home. Yeah. Anyway, we got our asses back home. But now, we left the he had already he had driven down there himself. This other was stayed stayed down there. Well, a few days later, he sends me a copy of this. Uh, and, you know, I tried to tell him. Well, you know, he he called me. Up, Why'd y'all leave? And I told him I said I ain't gonna sit there and subject subject myself to. Uh, to that, all that obviously hoax BS. I said I don't even want to be around that crap. And I, oh, it's not a hoax. That's bullshit. You know it is. And mm-hmm. anyway, we had we had some words back and forth, and and um, he I, I couldn't convince him. And I think he called up the other guys. You know, in fact, I told him that we all we all agreed unanimously as much crap. And I tried to give him a, you know, I tried to talk to him about what had happened down there at the. At the creek and the bridge, and I tried to talk to him about what had happened at Pat May's Lake, and I tried to talk to him about the different details about those videos. He wouldn't listen. Hmm. All right, 
the next thing. Here some days go past, and he sends me, he says, oh, man, you got to look at this, you got to look at this. We got a game cam picture. That we got a picture off of a game cam, and it was the exposure was all messed up. But I was able to to, uh, to work on the exposure and, and bring out what, what we really saw. Man, this is the best picture of a booger I've ever seen. And he sends it to me, and I open up and look at it. That ain't no booger I've ever seen. And he calls me up later on. He says, man, what do you think? What do you think? That's the best booger picture I've ever seen. I says, uh-uh. That doesn't look like any booger I've ever seen. doesn't even look anything like a booger. Oh, that looks just like the ones on my farm. I says, uh-uh. I've seen boogers on your farm. That ain't that, that, Those aren't the boogers on your farm. Oh, yeah, they are, man. No, they're not. Uh-uh. I said, I said, I've been all over this country chasing boogers. That ain't no booger. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah it is. Uh, it is. It really is. It, 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 it's just, you, it, you know, and uh, he wouldn't listen. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so he was spreading this all around. Well, another member of our group, I believe it might have been Dan Rickey, got to looking at that, he, and got to looking at that picture, and he says, you know, I think I've seen that picture before. So he gets to digging around in magazines. And I don't remember if it was Argosy Magazine or Scientific American or the Smithsonian Magazine. One of those three, he finds that picture, the exact picture. Oh, wow. And <laughs> and it was a picture of a Neanderthal, an artist's rendering of a, a good artist's rendering of a Neanderthal. And so he laid into the guy that had had been spreading it around. Well, it got back to Mike Humphreys, and <laughs> Mike Humphreys just absolutely shredded this guy. And wow. in fact, he started a uh, he had, at that time he had an active forum called the Kaimichi Giants, and he uh, and he shredded this researcher. You know, like I said, and tore him up, embarrassed him so bad that uh, that uh, the guy just had he had to drop out, and he went mm-hmm. underground for for a month. And then he tried to come back, and like I said, months had passed, and we'd all moved on. The the, the ones of us that were serious researchers, and all we were all still doing our thing, and we'd moved on, and and uh, we had taken up with a. I had inspired a guy named. Mike McLean to start the Alabama Bigfoot Research Forum, and um, anyway, we most of us were on, were on the ABRF forum, and anyway, I'd been on there for a while, and then this person, it was this person that had come on there using a, a, a using a, a different name than. There was a person that was on there using a, a name that I hadn't seen before, but I recognized his writing. I'm thinking, hmm, mm. I think that's you know that's mm. old so and so, you know that that, mm-hmm. that that caused this got blown out of the water in that big hoax that he was propagating. And sure enough, some weeks passed and he PM'd me. He said, "Hey, this is you know, tell me who he was." Right. And I said, well, why are you using this other name? He said, well, I tried to come back using my real name or in my old my old nickname, and, and everybody saw it, and they, you know, attacked me again. So I'm using this other name to uh, because they don't know that one, and, uh, you know, it allowed me to ease, ease back into the community. Well, mm-hmm. interesting thing, that's the name that this guy is still using to this day. Right. And most of his people that know him now don't know that he's using his false name um the thing is that these guys very successfully uh sucked in and fooled played on this fellow's ego and basically ruined him in the in the legitimate bigfoot community and uh if i had it to do over again i probably would not have ever become associated with him again right. but i figure i could figure i could you know forgive him and figured he hopefully he'd learned his lesson but um anyhow um well, let, let me ask you something else about yeah. another thing that i've that right. we've kind of talked about before um 
one of the pictures that one of these guys that's pretty prominent on the internet now who is everybody knows him everybody talks about him i'm not going to mention his name because mm-hmm. i'm not i'm not gonna i don't want to do that but right. one of the, one of the pictures i've seen in um some of the stuff that he's showing is a tree that is stuck in the ground with the root ball up in the air mm-hmm. now is that is that a common thing or you know have you seen that before or will you I talk about that a little it. bit i have seen it now it's a it is a thing that was discovered by a fellow in our group okay all right that deal with the uh with a tree broken off and jammed down into the ground upside down with a root ball in the air that is something that was discovered by a, f- a fellow researcher that I'm pretty close with and that is part of our group. And he was researching over in an area in Kentucky, not land between the lake, but over there in eastern Kentucky, excuse me, western Kentucky, and in an area that he and I both had found that the boogers were especially belligerent in in this particular area. And he had been in there, been going into this area, and believe it or not, this place is so bad, the boogers were so belligerent that I've left out of there during broad daylight uh, when I had gone in there in a boat and I felt threatened. Hmm. And he had been in in the morning, and I'm talking about in broad daylight, and he left out to go to go grab something to eat, if I remember correctly now. But for, he left out about midday out of that area. When he came back, as he was coming down. A public road, a paved road, he got to where, pretty close to where he had gone into the woods, and there in in the shoulder of the road, only about 18 inches to two feet off the edge of the pavement, but well within the raised, built-up area of the roadbed, where there's a lot of, lot of gravel and stuff like that right off the side of the road, there was this tree, there was this tree jammed down into the ground with a root ball up in there, about a six-inch diameter tree, hmm. about standing up probably about 10 feet in the air. He's like, holy crap. And this had appeared in the broad daylight. He went to grab something to eat, and he came back an hour or two, a couple of hours later, an hour or two later. And there that thing had appeared while he was gone in the broad daylight. So he sent me a picture of it and called me up asking me about it. And I said, well, I've seen that before a number of times. I said, and let me give you a little aside. My family owned a sawmill for decades, for for at least two decades that I know of. But um, and a common thing that loggers do when they encounter a bog, or some place where your skitter or your gear is going to get stuck, is they will take a, a smaller tree, you know, six, inch in di- six inches in diameter or smaller, and they will they'll break it off, you know, yank it up out of the ground, break the top out of it, turn it upside down, and jam that dude down with a root ball up in the air in that bog as a warning not to try to run across there with your skitter mm-hmm. that you're going to get stuck. Or we would do it in places a lot of times, you know, you're making a, you're using a, what we call a skid road, um, or a logging road, you know, a drag road or something to, to, to drag the stuff out of the, drag your lumber, your logs and stuff out of the woods. And you will break through into a wet weather spring or you'll, you'll wallow out a place in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the road or whatever so bad that your skidder will get stuck. And let me tell you, when you get a skitter stuck, you really got you really got a mess on your hands. Right. It takes something really serious to get it out of there. 
So we would jam a, like I said, we'd jam a, uh, a damn tree upside down out in that in that mud hole to let you know that it ain't just a regular mud hole that, that you're going to get stuck in it. Well, we started wondering if, obviously, you know, because of the thing appearing when it did and right there, that it was directed at him personally. Mm-hmm. Because the boogers in there were, like I said, very belligerent. And they were belligerent enough that they had run me out of that uh, proximity. This is, this is you know, close to the, to the Cumberland River. They had run me out of that area, and I was up in there in a boat, up in a slough. And, and it, it scared me out of there during broad, day, you know, during the daylight. And, and, and I had gone, I got out on the main river and went down a couple of sloughs and came back up in there. Actually, I was fishing in a bass tournament. I wasn't out boogering. And they ran me out of that place. So wow. um, that's how bad these boogers in that area are. But now, we have got curious about, has anybody else seen this? So we posted on the ABRRF about it and, and on the and the Bigfoot forums about it. Of course, people came back and talked about, you know, jamming and you know, the, the showed us pictures of, pe- of them jammed down in bogs and stuff like that. Of course, we knew about that. Right. But then we got some pictures in for some guys up in Alaska of a line of them like that along the side of a mountain. And this is up this is up on, you know, in uh, on steep ground. Obviously not, you know, not any bogs there. Right. And there was like a line of, you know, four or five of these every uh, every, every few hundred yards apart. So I got a hold of him. I said, hey, man, have you looked at these pictures that we got from these guys up in Alaska? And he looked at them, and, and he said, he said, wow, because these were taken from like across a valley and uh, so that you could, you could clearly see them in a line down this mountainside. I said, where you're at, is that up close to like a, a ridge or something? He said, well, yeah, sort of a low ridge. I said, you ought to go up and down that ridge, see if you can explore that area and see if you can find any more of these. Well, he found a couple of more. So, and again, they were up on they were up on dry ground. Right. By the way, the highway department came to try to pull that thing up out of the shoulder of the road, and Mark had gotten a hold of it and, just, and tried to pull it up. He couldn't budge it, so he got a hold of a guy that he knew to come try to, to come pull it up. They hooked onto it with a with a hydraulic rig, the same as what they set road signs with, mm-hmm. and they were able to pull it, and the damn thing was jammed about two feet down on the ground. Oh wow! Yeah, what in the world could do that? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yes, we do know about we do know about that, and yes, it's true that that is a sign that has been used for decades by loggers to mark bogs and places that you shouldn't go. But boogers also use it to designate places that they don't want us going. I don't know if that's something that they learned from us from watching. I don't know. But I do know that if you come up on a if you're up on dry ground, you're not in a in a boggy area and you come up on a tree trunk jammed down on the ground with the root balls up in there, that is directed at us. I believe it's directed at us, not other boogers, but specifically directed at humans. And you better be, you better watch out. That's that's what I was that's what I was fixing to ask you. Um, yeah. It, you know that that's what it kind of sounds like to me. It's uh-huh. number one. I, number one, they've seen uh, loggers doing that. Right. Exactly. And I, you know, if it was my territory and they were destroying the trees in the area. Uh huh. <laughs> Yeah, I I think I would take that into consideration. Maybe we need to do this yep. to to keep them out. Yep. Yeah, I think they've learned it. But it, and it's it's not just. Uh, I mean, here we are. We find the first time we ever find, come across these is in Western Kentucky, and the very next thing that we get in a that that's similar comes out of freaking Alaska. I've yeah. seen pictures of them. I've seen pictures of this out of out of Canada. I've seen pictures of it out of Oklahoma. And what's really crazy is Lauren Coleman used it in a, when he was helping them make the movie Exists. He was right. one, of their te- one of their technical contributors. And he gave them, the, the guys that were making Exists, he gave them that idea. And they used it. In fact, if you pull it up online, the movie Exists, there's a picture of a car, a, you know, a smashed up car, and there's a, a Tree jam down in it with the root balls up in the root ball up in the air <laughs> as the main advertising poster for the for the movie. Now, 
None of us have ever seen seen that jammed down in a, in a vehicle or anything like that before, ever. Right. That's just right. something that's just something they made up for the movie. However, later in the movie, if you watch the movie, they there is a section in there where where uh, this is where they finally find they get into the you know, into the core of the boogers territory, and there is. There in the background, you can see one of these trees jammed in the ground with the root ball up in there. Now, it's it's that's not quite in the right context. In in real life, it would be back a distance away from the core area, but not not right in the core area. Right. It would it would be you know back a distance away to keep you out of the core area. But there were several things in that movie that that are legit things. That uh, that were gotten from us, right? Uh, for instance, the lair where the where the where the Bigfoot was living underground, where they found one of the guys that had been abducted. Um, that was a fairly accurate description, but not quite. It was uh, not as tall as they really are, and that was something that that Dan Rickey had had uh, had discovered and made and made known. In fact, uh, Dan. Took me and showed me the first one I ever saw, and I actually, uh, believe it or not, we were actually ignorant enough that we got <laughs> got the damn. I got down a damn creek. Dan covered me, and I crawled up in the son of a bitch and crawled up in the entrance of it and looked around. I'm just thinking when I think back about what in the crap would I have done if I <laughs> stuck yeah. my head in there and shined a damn light up in there and there'd have been a booger laying up in that place. Yeah. That, what that, would I have done? That son got to yank my would have yanked my head off so fast before Dan could have even gotten the safety off on his rifle. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me let me ask you this: that you mentioned exists, and this is kind of off topic, but uh-huh. uh, out of all the crappy Bigfoot movies that are out there, what what is the best one that kind of represents what we actually find in? out there in the woods when we're out there researching. My personal opinion is I think Exist is probably one of the best Bigfoot movies ever made. I'll agree with that. Now, now it was a low-budget movie made by the same people that did the Blair Witch Project. So, the, the, the size of the booger, they didn't do any CGI graphics. They didn't have the money to do any of that kind of crap. So they just got a great big old guy in a in a suit. Right is what the booger is, but they got the guy that they got to play the booger is pretty damn athletic, so he could run pretty good. But now, and the, the sounds that the booger makes aren't quite right, but they right. ain't that bad. But now they have some really good things in there. The throwing the crap, throwing things is is pretty damn accurate. The the way the thing chased the guy down on the bicycle is accurate. Right. There ain't no way that somebody on a bicycle can outrun a pissed off booger. No way. Right. Right. Because I have I had him I had him chase my truck one time and he was beside my truck at fifty miles an hour. Wow. Holding even with my truck. It wasn't until I got up to about 55 that I started pulling away from him. Tim, why'd you piss him off? Well, hell, all <laughs> we were doing was coyote hunting. <laughs> but, but now back to hoaxes. Uh, okay. Uh, but anyway, well, let me finish. Let me finish telling about exists. Um, okay. The um, uh, like I said, the, the lair was right. The the one that the one that Dan showed me that that I actually went and looked into got up and looked into, it was taller from the from the floor up to the roof. You could you could walk in it just being over. Uh, you didn't have to get down a belly crawler, can't crawl on your hands and knees. You could just just bend over and and walk into the thing. It was probably four feet high. The ceiling mm-hmm. was. It wasn't as large horizontally as what the one in the movie is. Mm-hmm. What the one in the movie is, but now the fact that it was up underneath trees, and they they specifically dig up into the bank, underneath tree roots, underneath uh, trees, so that when somebody comes walking along, that they're not going to fall through. Right. 
and uh, the, the tree tree roots and everything support the roof of the thing. That part is correct. The right. roots and everything hanging down. In fact, this one had so many roots and vines and stuff hanging over the front. I don't see how the hell Dan found it to begin with. I think he found where they'd been digging the dirt out, and you know there was dirt out front, and maybe found the tracks going in and out of it. I'd have to ask him for sure, but uh, but what right. was crazy was looking in there and seeing the finger marks in the dirt, seeing oh, where wow. they had been, seeing where they had been digging it out. That was just fascinating to me, mm. absolutely fascinating. I mean, that was sort of a almost a life changing uh, moment seeing how they that they excavate those things. Well, I. Uh, I... I've had a native in this area, Native American in this area, tell me that, um, or I've heard this. I can't remember if I was told this or anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he described them as brothers to the beaver. All right, I can believe that. Yeah, I can believe that. And I don't doubt that in some areas that they don't make make a den sort of a thing. Um, you know, if they don't have a good bank to dig up underneath. Uh, I know my great grandmother tells a story of told a story, and I've actually I can't remember if it's on the BFRO website or if it's on in the GCBRO database, but um, uh, I filed the report, and it's 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 in public, but it's up in um, uh, Watauga County, uh, North Carolina, when she was a girl back in the 1880s. And she heard a bunch of people shooting up on a ridge in a, uh, uh, above where she was down in a, along a creek gathering berries and stuff. And she heard a bunch of racket and yelling and shooting up on a ridge. And she heard somebody running down, running down off the ridge, coming down the hill towards her. And it scared her, and so she jumped up under the bushes that were close by her and, and you know, laid down and hid up underneath these bushes. And what she sees coming towards her is a Nunyunui, which is their word for, you know, Bigfoot. And it runs down, and it's, and it's, it's, uh, not a, it's a juvenile one, probably about six and a half, seven feet tall, and it's running, hunched over, holding its belly. And it runs down next to this creek, and there's a not too far from where my grandmother, great grandmother, was hidden, there was a the creek's got a curve in it, and there was a big pile of debris up on the creek bank where the water had been up. You know, where the creek had been up, and it had washed a bunch of of leaves and sticks and debris up onto the bank. And this thing laid down in the edge of that debris and raked a bunch of it over over the top of itself and hid itself. Wow. And once it was all covered up and had gotten still. My great grandmother, and then she heard the, then she heard a bunch of racket and heard the men coming down the, down the, off the ridge. Well, she jumped up and hauled ass, and you know ran home, and told her brothers about it, and they waited a bit and then went back up there and she, she showed them where the, you know where the booger had laid down and covered itself up, and it was gone. There was no, you know. Uh, the thing was gone, but now that's like I said, we're digressing. Um, <clears throat> back to um, back to hoaxes. <clears throat> um, I have one of the one of the hoaxes <laughs> that I was I was telling about people who had had legitimate sightings, but then just kept embellishing things. Trying right. to make something out of it that something out of nothing, or or more than what something really was. There was a lady in our group that was, uh, or she was not a. This was before the outlaws ever existed, but it was you know somebody that that we had gotten to know through uh, online, and we had, um, and she had she had boogers on her property, no doubt about it. She had handprints on the windows and stuff, and I've seen some of them, and they were legitimate booger-made handprints. And she had a fair amount of sign on her property, and she uh, was 
sort of clandestinely habituating them. Mm. And she would never really admit it. But I'm I'm sure that she was attracting them up to her house as much activity she had around her house. <clears throat> but they were scaring her, and so she had asked us how to, you know, what to do to to keep them from hanging around up there, you know, and and, and scaring them. So we told her, and I said, well, first thing you need to do is quit feeding them, quit putting crap out there for them to eat. You know, get all your dog and your cat food in the house. Don't leave any horse feed or you know livestock feed outside. Just, just you know, don't leave anything edible outside. Not garbage. Not nothing. You know, keep your garbage locked up in your garage or wherever until you're ready to take it out and uh, you know take it and dump it somewhere or either till the the morning they're coming to pick it up. I said, don't leave your garbage out. You know. Don't don't feed your dogs and your cats and stuff outside. Feed them indoors, where something can't come get their food. Because hell, I've got I've gotten reliable reports of them. Somebody going out there feeding the cat, and feeding their cat or their dog out on the back porch, and and even where they've got a a, a, a pet door coming in on the porch, and then they go the back out a few minutes later to do to do something else, and there's a damn big hairy ass, a big hairy arm. Reaching through the pet door, <laughs> scooping the scooping the, the cat food or the dog food out of the bowl. I've heard several reports of that. <laughs> but anyway, so we we told her how to keep them away. And then she comes up with this big big uh, story about how that they were doing something, and here comes this deer running wide open through her yard and a booger chasing it and the deer was looking back over its shoulder in terror as the as the booger was chasing it. Well anybody that's any that's a deer hunter, a, 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 a decent deer hunter that knows their quarry, and any farm per, farm boy that, that that knows much about livestock or horses or anything knows that when just about any large mammal is running, that they're, once they get up to, to stride, that their neck locks into position, that, they're, that the vertebrae of their neck lock into position, and almost all of your prey species, cattle, horses, deer, rabbits, any of them like that, they can see basically their eyes are on the side of their head enough, and they have horizontal slit pupils, and they can see basically 360 degrees. They don't have to turn their head around to see what in the hell is chasing them. They can either juke just a little bit sideways, just slightly change their direction of travel, and see what's behind them, or they can see ab about. They have a wide enough field of vision that that their fields of vision from each eye cross. Not only in front of them, not only do they, have, do they have binocular vision in front of them like we do, they also have binocular vision behind them, starting at about their rump, so that they can see something that's closing on them. They don't have to turn their head. In fact, they can't. As a matter of fact, proof of my point, anybody that's a horseman, or if you've watched very many Western movies or movies where there are, people are on horseback and they're running wide-ass open and they get shot, or whatever they want to simulate on movie, <laughs> them getting shot. What they do, you go, you just watch this. They yank one rein back hard. They pull the horse's head around to the side, and the horse cannot keep running straight. The horse tumbles. Right. The horse falls. That's the way a damn good cow dog. We used to have a. A, da a huge ass Angus bull. I mean, in an enormous Angus bull. <laughs> I've heard. I don't know if the thing weighed 2,100 pounds or not, but I've heard people say that that was that that bull weighed over a ton. All I can tell you is I know it weighed over about. I know it weighed in excess of 1,300 pounds. But this was a mean Angus bull, and it was always a big pain in the butt to move him. And we were trying to move him one day. And 
I had I had I had Bo. I hadn't had Bo very long. And I had no, we had no idea he had any aptitude towards cattle at all. None. He'd had no training of it whatsoever. And my dad was going to the back of the farm to help move this bull. And Bo wanted to go with him. And he said, well, can I, you know, is it okay for Bo to go with me? And I said, sure, let, let him follow you. Well, they got back there to the back of the farm. And my dad was, was holding the gate. And there was they were out there on a four-wheeler and a dirt bike trying to herd this bull through the through the gate. And the bull was chasing the four-wheeler and trying to get it. All of a sudden, here comes Bo flying out of somewhere, hit this damn bull in the side of the head, and took his ass down onto the ground. Wow. Hit the bull in the side of the head, clamped down on the bull's nose, and threw the bull on his side, onto his side. And the only way that a that a 90-pound dog could take a 1,300 to 2,000-pound bull running bull off his feet is the fact that he'd knock his head to the side and they can't they can't motivate they can't keep running they, they just fold up and fall right and anyway the what happened was Bo knocked the damn bull down through the bull and <laughs> held got him down on the ground they had a little come to Jesus meeting for just a second and hmm. Bo turned the turned the bull loose the bull got up to his feet and Trotted right through the gate with Bo trotting <laughs> along behind him. <laughs> but anyway, that's how that's how a uh, a dog, uh, you know, like I said, a seventy-five to hundred-pound dog could take a damn bull right off of its running bull right off of its feet. If it hits the side of his head, it, it messes him up. But anyway, so back to the point of the damn story is that. Anybody that knows large animals very much at all knows that no, they can't run while they're looking back over the top, back over their shoulder. So when this lady got telling this story, we knew that she was making it up. Right. And so she got called on it. Well, the lady, rather than saying, "Oh, well, maybe I was just mistaken. Maybe it was it was looking back over its shoulder and hearing the booger." You know, the booger comes running, it looks back over his shoulder and sees it, and then, <laughs> and then it takes off running. That's plausible. But not that it came running wide-ass open through the yard, running for its life, looking back over its shoulder. Uh-uh, right. that didn't happen. <laughs> and so little details like that, you know, will get you hung. <laughs> you know, we, we knew that, that she wasn't telling the truth. Uh, you know, we've had a real famous one, uh, Janice Carter Coy. She sucked in and then nearly ruined Mary Green. And it was, uh, again, a, a habituation situation where, you know, she, no doubt, no doubt she she had a boog- boogers hanging around her house because she was habituating the hell out of them, feeding them and doing all this stuff. But it wasn't enough just to tell that there were boogers coming around her house. She started adding more and more to it and embellishing mm-hmm. it more and more. And Mary, unfortunately, you know, Mary knew that it was that yeah, there are boogers there. But she got drug into this deal of the thing having a, you know that it had a name that it you know that it that it. You know, it had a name, and that you know, it was talking to him, and all this. I don't even, I don't even remember the details of the story. Somebody else can, can, you can. I don't know if you can look it up anymore or not, but somebody else may not know more of the story. But I, I really, really hated that Mary got sucked in by this lady, and. But, you have to be, you have to be careful all the time. Every story you hear, you've got to give it. You've got to evaluate it. I mean, we right. hear stories all the time where, uh, you know, there's just too much that happened. But, but again, that's just a just a uh, just an example of somebody embellishing their story because they want they want more attention. Uh, well, unfortunately for for doing what we do. Um, 
I think we're going to – I think the hoaxing is going to continue. <laughs> oh, it is. It is, definitely. That's why every single story that you hear, you've got to – You've got to e- evaluate it critically. And, right. and another thing, too, somebody may have a legit story, but they've interpreted it, a, a legit encounter, but they've interpreted the intention of it or what was going on incorrectly. Or right. somebody didn't know what the hell they were doing has has interpreted it incorrectly. Some of you may have heard the story about... Uh, about the guy that was a uh he worked for a company that that delivered magazines to con, you know convenience stores and places like that around uh around northern Alabama northern Mississippi mm-hmm. and he broke down on the side of the road um serpentine belt on his delivery truck broke in the middle of a thunderstorm and he and he was sitting there waiting. He stranded on the side of the road in this horrendous storm, and he had to um, he'd been waiting and waiting. Well, he had to relieve himself, so he just opened the side door of his of his delivery van. This is a big truck, like a UPS truck. He opened the side door and started to relieve himself, and lo and behold, there's a booger standing there right outside the door. And he ends up peeing on the booger's foot, mm-hmm. and the booger went crazy and and you know screamed at him. It scared the guy half to death. The guy falls backwards over uh, a bunch of the the stuff in his truck, and he's he's falling over. He's on his back. His feet are up in the air over the over the boxes he just fell over. The booger's sticking his head in the truck. The guy carries carries a. Uh, a semi-automatic pistol on his person at all times because of the the danger of what he does and where he does it and the hours he does it in. He pulls out his pistol and starts shooting at the booger. Mm. I don't think from his description that he hit it, but he definitely scared the bejeevers out of it. It takes off running. The guy manages to, to scramble up, get to his feet, and he's looking out the door, and a lightning strikes again, and there's... The the one that he shot at's running away. There's two more standing there with, like deer in the headlight. Like, what the hell is going on? You know. And, right. <laughs> and I think he fired another shot or two, and they took off running. Well, he he appeared on a on a well known uh, blog talk or not blog talk show, but you know, it's just a well known uh, weekly podcast show. weekly show. Right. And they had him convinced that the boogers were coming in there to eat him. To kill him and eat him. Yeah, I, guy, I heard that. I heard that show, yeah. and the guy right. was practically crying on the freaking radio show. Yeah, exactly. He was terrified. Well, I heard about it. Exactly. Well, I heard about it, and somehow somebody got me his phone number, so I called the guy up, and I said, and I know those boogers right there. I've researched that area since the 1970s. I've driven through that area hundreds of times. I'm extremely familiar with that area and with the boogers there. And uh, I've never heard of now. They're well known for they're very well known for chasing dirt bikes and four wheelers and stuff in their area. They're very well known for that. But they I've never heard of. There's not any disappearances there that I know of. There's never been people mutilated or anything like that. And so I called the guy up. I said, something else is going on here. So I got to question him, and lo and behold, I, first thing is I, asked, I I talked to him about the direction that the that the rain was coming from and all that. Well, I figured out that the guy was pretty observant, that the deer, just the deer, the boogers came from directly downwind of his truck, straight downwind of his truck. I said, Okay, then if they came from straight downwind of the truck, there's something, some kind of a smell coming from his truck that attracted them. Sure. So I got to ask him, what did you have in there? And well, what do you mean? I said, well, did you have anything in there like food or like a bunch of hamburgers or fruit or something? Fruit? Yeah, I had several cases of fresh fruit that I had bought and that yeah, I was taking home. There you go. 
And I said, where were they? And he said, well, they were up in the front of the truck between the seats. Well, that's where the when the booger came was leaned over and stuck his head in the truck. He was looking towards the front of the truck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, I said all they were doing. I said they weren't coming to kill you. They were coming to steal your fruit. Yep. All they wanted was a fruit. And this was in April. And this is before there were any when that happened to the guy. And that's before there's any fresh fruit growing in, in there. That there, there's no fruit to eat anywhere there on any of the, the, the native trees in that area there in North Mississippi. So for them to to smell fresh fruit, oh my goodness, you know, you know, this yeah. time of year, hell yes, they're going to follow that scent and try yeah. to find it. So yeah. again, this was a. This was not a hoax story of of the boogers trying to kill him. This was a story of of some boogers that that were coming there to to get that looking for that fresh fruit that they smelled because they were hungry. And this unfortunate chain of events just happened to happen, mm-hmm. you know. So, and yeah, I'd be pe- I'd be PO'd if somebody peed on my foot. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I'd yell at them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Or try to turn the truck over. Exactly. <laughs> so, oh. so uh, you know, there's uh, another thing that could cause hoaxes. And this has happened to me on multiple occasions. As a matter of fact, <laughs> me and uh, old... Uh, uh, yeah, Scott Hayes. <laughs> we were researching back uh, last year along the Des Moines River, and we were uh, we were just not very far from D- the city of Des Moines at all. And <laughs> Scott had found this place, and I mean, it's like it's like the purgatory area out there in Oklahoma. This oh, place wow. is really badass. I mean, this this place is really badass. An old road bed cut down nine, ten feet into the ground. This is it goes down to an old ford across across the Des Moines River that's been in use since back in the since white man first came into the area. You know, wow. back in the, you know seventeen hundreds, eighteen hundreds. So it's really cut down into the ground. And I mean, you drive down in there, and I it's ungodly boogery. So Scott had found it in, <laughs> during the daytime. And and he found you know found some sign and everything. So we went down there that night. <laughs> we drove down there. This is one of those places that there was just the two of us, mm-hmm. and we got out of the truck. And I said, Scott, I said we can't stand in one place here. There's definitely boogers in here. We've got to keep moving. We got to keep circling this truck. Because if we stop, they're going to sneak up behind us. They'll be underneath this damn truck. Right. <laughs> and I said, I don't. This is not the kind of place I want them reaching out grabbing my ankle. <laughs> and so we were down there, and and our skin's crawling anyway. Well, what we didn't know was about 250 yards away up the river. There's some people fishing on the bank, kept fishing on the bank. <laughs> Maybe, oh, I might have been a little bit further. It could have been 300 yards, you know, because water, sound carries over the water. Sure. Well, I cut loose with a call, one of my good calls, and we hear from up the river, here, what in the hell is that? <laughs> 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 and, 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 and then we hear a lady's voice, what was that, honey? What was that? I don't know. <laughs> And, we, and so we, we started laughing, Scott and I did, we were chuckling, and, and then in a minute I let out another one, and we hear a bunch of more, you know, react, get a, you know, a bunch of more reaction to it, you know, cussing and, and hell raising and stuff going on, and, 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 uh, and so we, we thought, 
<laughs> those people there's going to be a report in the paper tomorrow of hearing mysterious screams <laughs> down on the on the Des Moines River there. <laughs> well, I, I can I can relate to that story. Oh my gosh, I uh, I took a couple of people with me one night, and uh, there was about four of us in the truck, and uh, I, I was looking. We went to the Cimarron River, which is just north of me here, and. Yeah. Uh, I found a place to park along the river, and uh, it was an old well, oil well site. Uh-huh. Uh, it was solid ground, so I didn't have to worry about getting stuck or anything like that. So I, we sat up there and they killed the engine. We sat there for a little while, and, and uh, I, I let loose with a couple of calls, and uh, I hear this little old lady. <laughs> she starts asking her husband, what was that? He goes, I don't know. And I just, I thought, oh, my gosh, I can't believe. <laughs> what I didn't notice was there was a house, there was a house probably 200 yards from me where I was at, and we didn't see the house when we went in there. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I scared these old people to death. We need to get out of here because they're probably going to call the sheriff. And uh, yeah. But looking back on that now, I mean, it's funny because, you know, they they had no idea, no clue, and they were hearing somebody howl, and, you know, they just panic mode set in because they'd never heard that before. <laughs> so. we, we, I was at work one day, uh, you know, where I, where I work. The guys used to give me hell all the time about, about you know, researching Bigfoot. I got tired of it one day. We were sitting around. It was it was a Friday. It was a Friday at lunch, and there was about fifteen of them ganged up on my ass. Everything. I said, "Tell you what," and it was it was uh, it was in the fall, and the leaves were off the trees. And I said, "I said, tell you what, all you loud mouth. I said, we'll go out tonight. If y- y'all ain't got a hair on your ass." If you won't go out with me tonight, and I said, and y'all can pick the place. I said, I said, you just go out. I said, I said, I'll meet you down at, you know, I've told them the place we're going to meet. I said, I'll meet you down there at six thirty, seven o'clock, and you point any damn direction you want to, and we'll go that direction, and in a, in a, in, a, in an hour or less, I'll have you into boogers. And oh, that's bullshit. I says, try try me try it mm-hmm. and well, it turned out only one guy took me up on it mm. so and he said he said i want to go down there where the momo hang out well that's that's the salt river the salt river watershed here in, in northeastern missouri mm-hmm. so off we go so the first place that we come to on the salt river watershed is union covered bridge outside of paris missouri and there's been a few sightings down there, so we we get down there to Union Covered Bridge, and there's like three cars, three carloads of people down there fishing along the river. And they've got camp, you know, fires built on the riverbank and everything. And actually, there's like three fires on the riverbank in different places. There's like four or five carloads of people there that, you know, maybe a couple at one of the fires, a couple at another fire, and one fire, one car at another fire. Right. And so there's a there's a you have to ford the you can't drive across the old covered bridge there anymore you have to ford the river, so we we ford the river in my truck and came up on the other side. Well, uh, anybody that's much of a researcher knows that a good place to to research is and to, the boogers like to hang out around old quarries and stuff because right. the ground's been disturbed there's been salts and stuff like that that have been exposed. So there's a there's a quarry nearby, and so we drive down to the down to the quarry, and I pull up outside the gate, get turned around, pointed out. Now, through the woods, we're only about maybe 250 yards from the riverbank, and I'm thinking, well, I really don't want to scare these people too badly, so I'm going to make sure that all my calling is in the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. And I had even brought me a megaphone to yell through to, to try to direct my voice away from these people. 
And I really hadn't used it all that much. That may have been the first time I ever used it. <laughs> and so I cut loose with my first call, and up to, up to over to her back, I hear, God damn! <laughs> 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 and across the field, in the direction I hollered, we got a loud answer. Oh wow! A really loud answer, and in just a minute, it he calls again, even louder. So it was coming towards us. Oh wow! So I cut loose another call, and it, <laughs> I heard somebody say, "I'm getting the blank out of here," <laughs> and we start hearing them <laughs> tackle boxes slamming and car doors slamming and trunks and everything, and cars cranking up. And gravel slinging. <laughs> Those people opened up extra large cans of, of gone and got the hell out of there. Yeah. <laughs> the boogers came up to within about about 150, 200 yards of us, but didn't want to cross, wouldn't cross a big open field to get to us. Wow. So we had a we had a um, the poor old boy that was with me scared him so bad. That he he jumped back in the truck, yeah, and I he didn't said, want no I, more. he didn't want no right. more of that. Well, his his bad night had just started, really. Mm. And uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, we we uh, I had Griff with me, and and you know, I said I said, look, you can you can stay out here. Everything's cool, you know. I said I said we don't have to go to Griff's. <laughs> it's time to go, or, or till I you know I can see him, uh, you know, till we hear. You know, hear them coming. Actually, hear the footfalls. You know, you don't. Mm. I said it, everything's cool, and he finally got out, got back out of the truck, and he and we stood there next to the truck. And I wasn't scared to stand next to the truck then because you know I had Griff with me, and if any of them had tried to belly crawl up behind us, Griff would let us know. But anyway, we 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 only st- we were on there only there maybe fifteen minutes after I called. Made the first call because he got he just got too scared, man. He he was he was he was coming apart. He said, "Get, get me out of here." He said, well, I, he was he, done. He's done. So yeah. there we go, and we got back to, to the to the river, and uh, those fires were all doused. I have to give those guys credit; they did take the time to douse the fires. The yeah. fires were doused, and there was not a soul on that riverbank. They were gone. Wow, you know there's, there's a, you know there's a lot of fun in what we do, and uh, yeah. but there are some serious times, and yeah. uh, uh, I, I want to relay the story if you don't mind. Um, oh, go ahead. I had I had for those of you listening, I had the pleasure of going to Land Between the Lakes this year. It was the first time I've ever been out there, and uh, was out there with Tim and. Um, there are a couple nights that we went out and we had, we had, we didn't really, I don't think we had very good luck. Um, there was one night that we had some pretty good luck and uh-huh. actually, actually got a call back. But, um, the last night that, that we were there that we went out, uh, Tim took us over to where, um, some of the horror stories of Land Between the Lakes happened. And we were over there. And um, and I I think you made a couple calls there, and um, and you kind of were standing close to me, and and all of a sudden I just had this bad feeling that we were in trouble, and that's when I came to you and I said, Tim, I'm I got a bad feeling, and. uh, I think you even told me that you you had a bad feeling too at that time. Yeah, I did. And, and about uh, then, <clears throat> go ahead. Did, didn't Peck walk up about then and said, "Tell us the same thing." Yeah, and and yeah. plus, who was it that was with us that said that they had dream had a dream uh, the night before? Oh yeah, yeah. Was that Ken? Uh, hell, it might have been Ken. Uh, I can't remember, but yeah, somebody had a, had a, had a dream about the place, and we and, fl- we flipped on the flashlights and, and everything, yeah, and 
and he he freaked out because he said, "Oh my gosh, this is the exact place where the, that that I had the dream." That's right. That's exactly. Right. He said, he said, he said that bush right over there with those vines hanging out. He said that was in my dream. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> what what did he dream? Do you remember what he dreamed? I Didn't, can't recall. I I think if I remember correctly, yeah. he dreamed that a booger was sneaking up on him. Yeah. Right, that there was that there was a booger who was hiding, was sneaked out from around where that tree was. Yeah, and where that where that bush with the vines hanging out of it. Yeah, and and once we kind of come together and everybody was kind of feeling the same thing. Yeah, um, you know, Tim was Tim was right there and said, "We got to get out of here." Yeah, and um, I, that was. You know, going back to we do have fun when we go out there, but we take the situation seriously, and uh, I believe you have to in this situation. There, this ain't any kind of thing for amateurs who don't know what they're doing by any means. Well, what what's interesting is is I don't know if to, if you've heard this if I've told you this, Chuck, but some weeks later or months later. I was talking to another another uh, gentleman who has researched that area extensively, who grew up who grew up north of Land Between the Lakes, north of the north of Grand Lakes uh, right. or Grand Rivers. He was very very familiar with that area, and now our buddy Kentucky Mark doesn't know the guy, but he and Kentucky Mark has only lived there for maybe the last fifteen twenty years, something like that. Maybe a little mm-hmm. bit longer, but this guy grew up there, and he got to telling me about this place where the dog men is one of their main hangouts, and he said, and he said he thinks that's one of the main places that they get together to breed, and it's what this guy said. I'm thinking, what? And my right, right. my 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 BS meter is going off. Right. And I said, "Well, what, what, what are you? Where are you talking about?" And when he told me, it was that exact place. Oh my gosh! Yes, yeah. he said. He said, "Let me tell you." And I hadn't told him anything about us being down there. He said, "Let me tell you what." He said, "That's a place you don't go to after dark." Oh my gosh! He said. He said, "When I was growing up, he said we used to fish down there. He we used to fish down there, and our asses were out of there at least." At least thirty minutes before sundown, mm. he said. He said you don't go down there after dark. He said the damn dog men hang out down there. He said. He said you know you ever noticed that there's there's bathrooms and stuff like that down there and stuff, but you never ever see anybody down there after dark. And I got to thinking about it. He's right. I've driven wow. through there a bunch of times in the dark, and I've never seen anybody down there. Wow. And there was nobody down there when we were there, if you remember, Chuck. Right. It and was I'm just like, us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I, then I started telling him about us being down there. He said, you all were down there. After, what time was this? And I said, probably 10, 30, 11 o'clock. He said, oh, my God. He said, you guys are crazy. And I said, no, we're not crazy. We're stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, we didn't know. I said, we were all looking and everything. He said, he said, hell. He said, "There's never less than than two or three or four damn dog men down there." Oh my goodness! And That's I said, crazy. Well, and uh, now how he knows that I don't know. Yeah. And that he could be again. You got to take it with a grain of salt. But right. the fact that he mentioned that exact same place, and that you don't go down there after dark, and we'd been down there after dark, and every one of us was creeped out. Yeah, totally creeped out. Yeah, <laughs> but you and, know what? Tim, and we're talking about and we're talking about guys that have been doing this for decades. <laughs> well, and that makes that makes a lot of sense because that's where those events took place. Yeah, all through that area. Exactly. Now, and also you remember later on that I told you that when we were we had that incident where we. The one time that we were pretty sure that we called one to us, right, and that we heard that we heard its vocalizations, that it came from down there. Remember mm-hmm. that? Yep. 
I remember that. And that's why we went down there. I said, well, let's go down there where that one came from. And that's the whole reason we were there to begin with. Yeah. That night. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You just made every hair in my arm stand up. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but uh, back to the back to the uh to the thing about the hoaxes, you know, the thing the incidents that I just told about on the Des Moines River and down there on the Salt River, people could have those some of those people could have very well gone and filed a report. Sure. Exactly. And you know, that they heard a a Bigfoot screaming over there, and now at the down on the Des Moines River, we never heard any vocalization. We never got any answer whatsoever, mm-hmm. and it was all me that those people were hearing. Right on the Salt River, the first call that I did, where the guy yelled out the big loud GD, that was at me. But when the booger started hollering back from across the field and coming towards us, I'm sure they could hear that too because we could hear it loudly. Right. And then when I made my second call, that's when they decided they'd heard enough. <laughs> they, they packed a, every, all of them, every single one of them. They, I mean, they got the heck out of there. So that was a combination of, of me plus real boogers. Right. That time. Well, you know, here in, here in Oklahoma – um, and when we hardly ever hear any sounds, hardly ever. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, about the only place that you actually hear vocalizations or wood knocks and stuff is is more uh-huh. southeastern Oklahoma, down around Hanabi and in that area. I mean, we have yeah. heard them down there, but uh, for the most part, you don't ever hear uh, vocalizations at all. Yeah. And I think. I think it's because, I mean, Oklahoma's full of ravines and and stuff like that, and uh, that's that's pretty much where they're at. I mean, they that's yeah. how they travel because there's so much open space in Oklahoma. I think that they're smart enough to realize that if they did any kind of vocalizations, um, they, they'd be found pretty easy. Uh huh. Well, I I'm, I can sort of agree with you there. When I was when I first started researching up in up in uh, the uh, Mescalero Apache Indian Reservation in New Mexico, we got no vocalizations at all. Now they would throw rocks at us. I mean they were, I mean it's like walking into an artillery barrage at time. They they never hit us. They they hit. Clyde got hit by a got hit in the shin by a ricocheting. Uh, in fact, we're going to have to edit this out. I need to take his name out of here. Carl got Carl got hit in the shin by a ricocheting rock as we were leaving in an area one time, and instantly the rock throwing stopped. But the only vo- the vocalization that we had heard just prior to that that made us finally turn around and leave is we heard one growl at us. Oh yeah. It was a it was a low, deep very menacing growl that right. we could hear coming from up above us over the rim of the uh, over the rim of this draw that we were in this creek bed that we were in and when i heard that i well we both decided it was it was time to go and <clears throat> i i was researching here a year or so ago down along the uh colorado river right on the the arizona california border uh not too far from Needles, uh, California, and we were down in a down in a prime prime area, and <clears throat> we'd been down there a while listening, and had not heard a thing, and I did a call, and got a very faint, one very faint answer. Uh, from out to the uh, to the southeast of us, and we we hung around there for a while until we heard something moving out. And there's a lot of um, I don't know what that grass is called. It, it grows along the uh, some kind of a water water weed or water plant. But there's a uh, 
there's acres and acres and acres of it out in these marshy areas along the, the Colorado River there. Right. And, and it grows up overhead high. It, it's not it's not cattails. It's some other. I forget what the name of it is. I've I've I heard the locals calling it some kind of a name. I can't recall it right off the top of my head. But um, anyway, we heard movement out in there, and it sounded like the movement of something large. And so we. And I started getting that feeling it was just me and my, my wife and I out there by ourselves, and I didn't want to get her into a situation of having one, you know, right there and sitting on the hood of our car, so I figured it was time to go. So, right. <laughs> but, yeah, they – most of the places I've researched out there, you know, I've heard – out west I've heard very few vocalizations out in these open areas, like you said. And uh, <clears throat> um, I've researched out in the area around the Superstition Mountains, and I was really interested when those <clears throat> when that TV show came on on I don't remember if it was on National Geographic or Discovery or what channel where where they were looking for treasure out there in the superstitions, right? Because because I I researched around the superstitions a pretty good bit. And, did a fair amount of calling and such, and I heard one time what I'm pretty sure was a booger call out there, out on the south side of the superstitions, and but I never had one answer my calls ever out there, but several times I would uh I would call, and sometime later on, say 20, 30 minutes later we would be hit with this overwhelming uh, feeling of, of danger and anxiety and sometimes even terror, mm -hmm. which I believe they were zapping us with infrasound. Right. But uh, I know uh, I was trying to hang in there one time because where we were, I figured if they had gotten very close to us, I thought that they would have, that we would have been able to see them. That was before I had realized how effectively they can belly crawl right up on Right. There. And it was just me and myself and one other guy, uh, another engineer who was a pretty good researcher. Um, and we did not realize the danger that we were in. Mm. Uh, but he actually picked up on it. Uh, he was the first one to mention it. I had been feeling that we were in danger for a, for a bit and finally he said he walked over to me and he clicked his light on and, his, and every hair on his arms were standing up and his hat and I get this way sometimes his hat would not stay down on his head his hair was standing up so bad his hat was coming up off of his head <laughs> he said well, he pulled down his he said he'd pulled his hat down back on his head three or four times and it kept coming up coming off again and I said well I said I would, I'm creeped out too maybe we do need to get out of here I'm, so. I'm lucky I don't have that problem since I'm bald <laughs> <laughs> you know you, you talk about the grouse and we're going to wrap this up yeah. pretty quick because it's getting, getting kind of late yeah. and we've been on here a while but uh, you talk about the grouse now I have heard twice um a growl, a, sh a very short growl, but it was uh -huh. very deep, and I wasn't the only one that heard it. Right. And both, in both of those instances, somebody in the party got hit with infrasound. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I can, I can believe that. Um, but you know, they'll also hit you with infrasound and won't make any other, won't do a growl. I mean, it's sort of a multi-purpose weapon, but uh, but back to what you were, you know, what we were talking about earlier about the, the hoaxing and such is that, you know, you can have, you can have out, outright intentional hoaxes by people trying to gain, gain attention mm -hmm. or trying to suck somebody into a hoax to, to defame them uh, or, you know, to 
to shame them in the community or you know people just wanting attention wanting some somebody to talk to and you want to get some attention from a a researcher but then but that's different from people who hear things that that they think they've heard a bigfoot and it was one of us making a call sure uh, you know they can you know they might go in and i mean there's no telling what the some of those people that we ran off the that we ran off the Salt River went and told told folks. Sure, the, exactly. The next day, there's no telling. Uh, but you know that wasn't a hoax. That was just a mistake. Right. There's a huge difference. Right. And uh, and some of the, some of the calls I make are I learn my calls by listening to boogers. Right. And so you know the, the, the calls I make are. Pretty dead gum, pretty dead gum accurate calls. Well, within within the the range of, that my vocal cords can reproduce. There's a lot of stuff they do that I can't even begin to reproduce. Right. But, well, uh, I know I I heard a lot of the uh, the calls that you make. I heard a lot of those same kind of sounds when I was down in uh, Southeast Texas at at the uh, Sam uh -huh. Houston National Forest. Right. Yeah, those boogers down there are extremely vocal. Yeah, extremely vocal. I've never, I've never heard boogers. The, the most, the most vocal boogers that I know of are in East Texas. Oh yeah, absolutely. Over a over a wide area of East Texas. I mean those 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 are are the most vocal ones that I know of anywhere in the United States. And like I said, this is coming from somebody that's researched in the boonies. At the right place and right time in 38 states, mm -hmm. and uh, but but something I want to I want to reiterate. I've said this many times in the past, but I want to reiterate it for people. This this may be the first time that you've heard me talk. Just because I have researched in 38 states, don't mean I doesn't mean that I have found boogers in 38 states. I spent a lot of time. Researching in Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine, and never found squat. Hmm. I was in, and I was in some of the best areas up there, but that doesn't mean that they weren't there. That was fairly early in my career of of researching, and one of the things that I learned that as you get up into these northern forests, these boreal forests. Um, it's, it becomes more difficult to find them. They are they are in more isolated spots, and that's why, to me, it's a whole lot harder finding boogers in the Pacific Northwest than it is in in most of the eastern part of the country. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. uh, eastern and, and south, southeastern and stuff part of the country. And even there, even in the Midwest, it's, it's a lot easier to find them than in the Pacific Northwest. But I, I mean, I looked all over. I've been up in all around Baxter Mountain State Park and uh, uh, Mount Washington and and uh, a bunch of those places along the New, uh, New Hampshire Vermont border. And I've been in the Bennington Triangle before I even knew that it was the, that it was the Bennington Triangle. And I found some spooky ass places. Let me tell you, that Bennington Triangle sky is that is a creepy place. I can tell you, some, I can take you to some places up there. And if you can go in and out of that place without your skin crawling, you're, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> but, uh, but I never found, I never, I never found any booger sign. I never heard one. I never got any response to any of my calls. Mm -hmm. I found plenty of people who said who said they had had encounters. Right. But I just I never had one. And uh, <clears throat> maybe been, you know just just because uh, just because somebody you know has had an encounter in an area doesn't mean that you're going to be able to go in there and find them. Right. Uh, but uh, I've but then again I have I have found them in weird ass places I never dreamed that I would find them. Right. Right. I would we were, I would have never I would have never dreamed that they were here in Oklahoma or Texas. Yeah. 
Well, I I still remember the first encounter I ever had in Oklahoma, <laughs> and that was right down there, right down the the whatever that river is or creek or whatever that runs east west out of Honobi. I was uh, out there by Honobi uh, Creek. Maybe that's what it is. I, I I'd have to look on a map, but I was out about three miles, about three miles west of Honobi, and at about 1 a.m. in the morning, I was cutting through there. And I was expecting, to, hoping to find a gas station or something that was open because I had to go to the bathroom really bad. Finally, I couldn't hold it anymore, and I just stopped right there on the side of the road and got out walked over the side of the road to relieve myself. And and all of a sudden, I realized that I was in the middle of boogers. I mean, I was just, I was just, I never, never saw anything, never heard anything, but I was just, it was absolutely overwhelming, the danger that I was in. Right. And so I backed off the shoulder road, and I stood right in front of the car in the in the headlights. I couldn't even stay there, and so I walked around, and, and I finished up standing there, uh, you know, just right outside with the door of the car open, standing there with my butt pointed into a, into the interior of the car. <laughs> as soon as I finished, I just all I had to do was just you know sw- turn around, sit down, yeah, or just <laughs> sit down and go. <laughs> And that's when I got to, I got to looking at that area and studying that area, and that's when I discovered, oh my lord, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good area, very good. Yeah. Area. So. Yep. Well, Tim, any words of wisdom before we get off of here tonight? Well, I'll, uh, I'll just take a couple of things. You know, of my number one rules is when you're if you're going out. Going out bigfooting in your vehicle when you drive into a place, you always turn your vehicle around and get it pointed out in a safe direction. Get it get it pointed out in the in the in the safest, quickest direction out of there. And where all you got to do is jump in and fire it up and go, yank it in gear and go. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, keep your eyes and your ears open. Be aware that they will belly crawl into you uh right up to you and now it's not the i don't think it's the big alphas that will do that i don't uh all the ones i've encountered belly crawling were were the juvies and some of them might be older juvies but they were still juvies nonetheless right uh and uh one of the things i've learned is pretty consistent all around the country where i have encountered boogers is Typically, the first time that you go into an area and do some and do some calling, first couple of times, I'd suppose, uh, if they haven't been messed with much in the past, uh, you're going to get the attention of the alpha. Mm-hmm. And now, whether he decides to come to you or not depends on how much of a possible threat he perceives you to be. But even no matter how good of a caller you are, after you've been in there a time or two, they're smart. They're going. To, they know you. They know yeah. the sound of your vehicle. They know the sound of your voice. Yeah. After that, that, the ones that come are going to be the juvies, because you know, as we call them, gangbangers or whatever. They're the just like a bunch of teenage kids. You know, they they're always looking for something to get into. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And uh. Big Daddy's not going to come looking for you unless unless he perceives you as a threat. And, or he's had a bad day. Or he's had a bad day. And that's <laughs> another thing, too. That you never know. You never know what kind of a reaction that you're going to get, even even in groups that you're that you're familiar with. I mean, you don't know. He could have been. He could have been shot at. He could have been winged by somebody shooting at him. You never know. He could be sick. He could have a toothache. He could have stubbed his toe on a stump. He, you never know. No. So that's why that's why you should never let your guard down. Ever. Yep. I agree with that totally. Yeah. Yep. Well, Tim, I want to thank you for coming on the show, man. I'm this glad has to been. Be here. Been a pleasure, and uh, hope to have you back sometime. And um, 
looking forward to to go on more outings with you sometime in the future. And uh, uh, man, I love talking to you. I learned so much just listening to you, and uh, always have for quite a while. So, uh, but thanks for coming on the air. And uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> and come back and see us again. And we will and spread some more wisdom out to us. <laughs> okay, if you will. All righty. Well, I want to wish everybody a, a good night, and uh, thanks for listening, and uh, come back and see us the next time we have another show. All righty. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you, Tim. Good night. Good night. <laughs>